1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Twenty-seven, twenty-seven minutes before uh, 10, uh, 11 o'clock. Oh my gosh, I'll get it right. It's just such a nice day out there. You know what? I'm, I'm distracted by the beautiful day. I just want to go out there and be out there, Robin. I know it's beautiful. Uh, I have seen you um, run different things, and you are quite, quite the appropriate person to run things. Have you ever thought about running for office? Oh no, never. No, never have. You'd be good at that, though. It'd be good. We should have. We have a, an amazing superintendent of schools in our county. Oh yeah, she's Dr. great. Doctor Heidi, uh, Doctor Heidi, Doctor <laughs> Heidi Mayor. Mayor, thank you. I just how did, Sorry, Doctor, if you're listening, I just dropped your name, went out of my head. But anyway, I mean, you see somebody like Doctor Mayor, for example, and you say to yourself, "Now that that person could be a great president." You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if she's ever considered that, but she's she's doing a job that traditionally was held by a man. Right. And uh, yeah. and I don't know why we should be surprised. I mean, we're all human beings, but there's been this stigma for some reason on that we've had in our culture um, that certain people are better for certain things than other people. And, and of course, we're, what's wrong every time we think that it, it's wrong if you think a man is better at something. It's it's wrong if you think uh, you'd have to be a white man or it's, it's wrong. Mm-hmm. if you, you know, there's, there's everybody's got the ability to do anything they want to do, I think. Um, uh, Jennifer Palmieri is on the phone. Let me make sure I put the book on there. It's called, she's got a book called Dear Madam President. Jennifer is a political and communications strategist. She was the director of communications for Hillary Clinton's campaign. Uh, She served as the White House communications director for President Obama, the national press secretary for for the 2004 John Edwards campaign, uh, the National Press Secretary for the Democrat Party in 2002. Sounds like maybe she should run for president. Yeah. This is, uh, the book is described as an open letter to the women who will run the world. And I'm, I have no doubt that they're already running the world, actually. Jennifer Palmieri. Good morning, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm actually in um, uh, Palo Alto, California today. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you must be today. traveling. <laughs> so thank you for getting... Um, for it's not very nice here today. I have to oh. say, it's cloudy and a little chilly. Oh, really? Yeah, that'll happen. Mm-hmm. So what, what, is it, what is it that's happening in the world right now? Why is it, do you think, that we're seeing changes? And, and they're for the better. Um, yeah. and, and, then, and they're like growing pains. They're not happening as quickly as we want them. But why do you think they're happening at all? I think that, well, I think that we are on a, um, I think, you know, in the course of human history, you're on some sort of path of progression, and some of the um, changes that are happening for women in the world um, were probably fated to come at some point, but I think that the election of Donald Trump really hastened a lot of change in the way women are engaging in the world. And I think you had to decide, I know I did, um, for people who, for the women for whom that was a disappointing outcome, you had to decide either, I guess that's what's meant to happen in the world, guys like that are meant to become president of the United States, or what it proved to you is that women were playing by an outdated set of rules and we had to engage in the world very differently. Um, and that's, I think that pe- women found that moment sort of weirdly empowering because it kind of validated a lot of the doubts you had in your own head about things just don't seem right. I don't quite seem to be fitting in. This is harder than it should be. And I think that people are right to have that doubt because as much progress as women have made in the last hundred years, it's really only been a hundred years in the course of human history mm. that we've been engaging in politics in the workplace. And, yeah, yeah. you know, but I Jen- feel like Hillary proved a woman could win, but she did it a really hard way, which was we, we ran her um, uh, to sh- show that she could do the job the same way a man would, right? And that, like, robbed her a lot of her own but, uh, so humanity. It's, it's, so it sounds like the gender factor was a factor. Um, and and it had nothing to do with politics. Uh, for example, I mean, we, there was a few. Mm-hmm. There were a few ladies on the Republican side that were also considered viable candidates. 
Yeah, I think that, I don't think it's, I just think it's hard. I just think it's different for women running for office, and I just think it's a little harder than it is for men. I don't, you know, I, I think that Hillary proved it's possible for a woman to win because she got three million more votes, right? Um, and a few, few things could have gone a different way, and she could have easily been Oh, but, Jennifer, your, your yeah. phone is messing up. They're all gonna, know, they were. No. Can you tell? Okay, yeah, I don't Huh? Oh my gosh! It almost sounds like a short yeah. on a wire. Are you there? Yeah, it does. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm, sounds... I'm on a. I'm actually. I'm on a. Uh, I'm oh. not going to move a muscle. A landline. I found a spot. Is, is there, is there <laughs> a... No, I am on a landline. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm you're just s- not going to move. No, you sound perfect. Yeah. I think I've, but I found uh, a spot where it worked. <laughs> but in this book, uh, when you're writing. Uh, the in in the form of uh, uh, letters more so than advice. You even mm-hmm. had to push yourself in in order to accomplish all of the jobs and the goals that you set for yourself. Um, yeah, it was hard. It was the this campaign was a really brutal um, uh, endurance test. <laughs> it was people say it seems really grueling, grueling. I say no, it was harrowing. Um, and I got through it the way I asked Hillary how she had made it through really hard times. And she said that what she does is don't get overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem in front of you or the task um, and how hopeless something seems. She just gets up every day, does the best that she can do with what she has in front of her that day, and then she gets up the next day and she keeps going. And it's pretty simple advice, but I found it takes fortitude to do it, but I found that was how I, um, you know, that was how I managed. And I think a benefit of having had a lot of, you know, jobs, I worked in the Clinton's White, President Clinton's White House when I was um, very young, just, you know, basically right out of college. And I learned that these jobs are ask, are inhumane tasks, and we are all only humans, and there's only, um, um, you know, and I learned pretty early on that if you have talent, you work hard, um, trust that you're going to do your best each day, and that's how I uh, managed to get through. You know, a lot of women think that, I think a lot of women shy away from really hard tasks because they think they have to be perfect in order to engage in them. And, um, you know, that's an unrealistic uh, expectation of yourself. I, I let go of that, and I was able to. And, that's when you're able to do well. <laughs> when and, you let go of the need to be perfect, you can do well. In Hillary Clinton's years as the first lady, as, mm-hmm. w- as with Michelle Obama's years, as with a lot of first ladies, we as a country while we look to the president as the, the, the chief lawmaker, we look to the first lady as the chief, uh, I guess, coach or, or the, the person who's going to influence us in a, in a real way that has nothing to do with legislation. Um, and I think that's a pretty important role. I, I think they've all done a pretty good job of taking that first lady position and making it um, a, a positive thing for all of us. Yeah, and they... Um uh, and each one's done a little differently. I think, you know, Hillary had a hard time in the beginning because she was a different model. And she was the, the first one, first first lady who had had a career and outside of the home and the first one who worked on policy since um, Eleanor anyway and, you know, worked in the white, worked in the actual West Wing and took it on a controversial issue. And that took a little bit of time to, for us to adjust to that. Um, and that, you know, I think that's been, that's what happened happens to women who are always stepping outside of a role right, that, right. Um, you know, that you have normally normally held. And I think that for the baby boomer generation, they were always doing that, right? <laughs> um, Hillary was doing that her whole adult life, some from when she was a college student at Wellesley and protesting the war, and Bill Clinton's wife, who didn't change her name and didn't stay home to bake cookies. And, you know, so I think that's why you find... A lot of people, you know, you hear things about her that aren't necessarily mean-spirited that say, you know, I, I don't know, there's just something about her I just don't like, or there's just something about her I just don't trust, or I'm fine with a woman, just not this woman, and I think that we continue as much progress as we've made. It's still, um, these are still really big changes that are happening in society when women uh, take true, become true equals with men, and it takes a little bit of time for people to adjust to that, and that's what I think, that's what I wanted to examine in the book. So the next time a woman tries this, maybe you don't hear so much 
there's See, something about her I just don't like. Because we've thought about what's at the root of that. What effect do you think Margaret Thatcher or maybe Ang- Angela Merkel, what do you think mm-hmm. they, what effect has their leadership roles had on any future female president we might have here? I think it helps. I think any model helps. You know, it's just, I think that that is what, that was a, that's a real problem in the United States, that there hasn't been a, um, a model that we can look to for what it looks like for there to be a woman in the ultimate job, President of the United States. And, you know, what occurred to me very late on the campaign was that what we had done was turn, um, turn Hillary into a female facsimile of the qualities we look for in a male president. And I think that's why people think maybe she's a little inauthentic or, you know, why um, that uh, you, you people couldn't quite get a sense of her is that we were probably trying to force her into this ill-fitting suit, which is you have to do this job just like a man. Can, can I, can so I, I think that seeing Thatcher and, you know, Merkel helps, but it's harder when you still don't have that in your own country. Uh, while everything you say is probably true, I think there's more to it than that. I think, and this is not just based on my own thoughts, but since we do a talk show, we have calls from everybody. And, and, I, yeah. and, I, and I think a lot of the thought about Hillary was not just the fact that she's a woman or doing things in a man's world, but of, but of because mm-hmm. she had such history. So there were certain things that, that policy-wise that you would say, okay, if she's the president, based on what she's done on on other jobs, would she be able to do the job well? And some Mm -hmm. said yes, and some said no. I I don't Mm -hmm. think most of the listeners who called us, I don't think any of them, to be honest with you, said, I want to vote for her because she's a woman. I think it was either, I want to vote for her because, and they would give these uh, things she's done in her career, and, sure. and and the same thing would be from the people who didn't want to vote for her. They be they would be just just the, on the same track. I think that there's plenty of reasons to, to want to vote for her, not vote for her. And I said I don't think she lost because she was a woman. I just think that we have, um, I think that we have that either she's made. I think she proved that a woman can win. She proved that. Uh, even the people who didn't vote for Hillary thought she was competent, that she was able to do the job, able to be commander in chief. You know, research shows that. That's all really great progress. Um, but where I think that, in my experience, where what, what I did not expect to see and didn't appreciate how deeply set <laughs> these sort of views or instincts in people are, is how we still struggle with a woman seeking power and a woman with a lot of ambition. And that is still, that's where we got tripped up. That's where um, I think you get, if you you do hear people and callers say, I don't know, you know, I I hear from people a lot saying, I didn't want to vote for Trump. He had so many flaws, you know, but boy, she had so many flaws. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, or there's just something about her. I can't really say what it is. Or she's always so right, sketchy. Well, or she always seems like she's hiding something. That's where I feel. That is what I think is a, really about suspicion about a woman with um, ambition, because we don't really understand where that motivation comes from. Well, I and, think uh, people... You know, it's still, like, we've made a lot of progress, but that's, that's still there. Yeah, but I think when people are looking for someone, for a leader, for you know, to run, even if it's a business and not the president of the United States, they want to look for somebody that's going to take on a task or they already have an obligation and they want to finish it. When she quit her job as secretary of state, people were wondering why she actually quit and she didn't follow it through to the end. Well, she followed it through to the end of the first term. Um, and then Obama was reelected, and you normally replace people at that point anyway. But I think that they always have, you know, they liked her when she was Secretary of State, right? They liked her when she was in the job as senator. Um, she was very popular with her colleagues and with her constituents. But it's when she's running for office. I um, mean, you know, this is not unique to Hillary. It's when women are running for office okay. that the- they become less 
favorable. Uh, Jen, Jen, that's, I just think it's about. I think it's just about. I think it's about. And I, and I think we can overcome it. I just think that that's sort of a lingering question people have about women's motivation. Jennifer Palmieri is our guest, and and her book is titled "Dear Madam President." And it sounds like we're misleading people, though, as far as what the book is about. So I wanted to make sure we're fair to the book. Um, you're doing really well, first of all. Number five in the women in politics category on Amazon. Good for you on that one. But you're not really writing exclusively about Hillary. I mean, this is about the next woman, the, the first woman president, whoever she may be, correct? It is. A, it's written as a letter of advice to the first woman president, whoever she is, and um, whatever party she may be. Um, but it's also really meant to be a letter of advice for women who are engaging in the world now. And I mean, I, I had women of all ages in my mind because I find that that's where, you know, women across the board, um, older women, you know, women that are just entering the workforce, people graduating from high school and college, they are understanding that it's this world, you know, our country is only uh, uh, great when it is engaging by these uh, rules and that we all agree to live by and yeah, yeah. engaging in our democracy and they're doing that in a new way and that's ultimately so um, tell me, what it's about. Tell us what you what advice is in the book and, and as you said it would be for somebody even if you're looking to be the CEO of a corporation it's still the head position. Mm -hmm. What What is the advice? Um, the advice is on ambition. It's to keep a good, at, to keep a positive attitude uh -huh. about um, what you're trying to do. But understand that you know when you understand people have different questions for a woman looking to lead than a man, and um, you just need to meet people where they are and address it. And the um, you know if I had to sum it all up in one word that, or one sentence, it's people take their cue from you, and that each woman needs to understand. Um, her the power of her own voice, the importance of her own perspective, sharing that in the world, and you know you have, you need to speak up. That we still the world is still dominated by male voices, and I think as um, far as we've come in the world, I certainly have always thought that I could um, succeed in the world. I've done um, I've had uh, been privileged to have a really great career and good mentors, um, but you, you really you're still succeeding in a man's world. And what I think ha is happening now is women are deciding, okay, you know, so I feel I can do the job. I've always thought I can do the job just as well as any man, but I don't want to. I want to do the job the way I want to do it. And that's going to be and what, and a how, little different. And how, so, yeah, how would that be different? If, if, I, if I go to the doctor, I think that the, if I go to the yeah. doctor and the doctor walks out and the doctor is a lady, and this has happened to me, I, I didn't mm -hmm. think to myself, oh my God, she's not going to be able to do the job. I would just, I just said, hey, Hey, how are you doing? Because you know I know her. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah. in this case, right. but, but, so I don't know that maybe and maybe I'm not the the rule. Maybe I'm the exception. But I think I think men, uh, especially men who are fathers, I think and maybe maybe this helps. I don't know if it makes a difference or not. But it seems like we want our daughters to be treated fairly. We want them to sure. have the same opportunities mm -hmm. as our sons have. We want them to be president or or CEO or whatever or, or reach whatever goal they're shooting for yes and that's why I find um, men are buying this book for their daughters men are buying this book for their sons because what I think but what happens is think about this there's nothing more confident in the world than a little girl right they're full of confidence and joy and they're fearless and they think they're awesome and then something happens and around the time they turn 12 and they become inhibited and society sends them even despite parents best efforts societies can send them all these messages about you know what they're supposed to look like how they're supposed to engage in the world wait you know wait till your opinion is asked for um, and that continues on into the workplace and I think you know a lot of women suffer from this this sense that they call the imposter syndrome which is you know you have to be um, that you're going to be you're in a position that you're not really worthy of it and at some point you're going to be exposed that you have to be absolutely perfect you have to be a hundred percent sure that you well, have the right answer that's before men you too though I mean, we all feel like we're faking it. <laughs> I, th I think there's a certain amount of that with men, too. And, and yeah, we're all worried about we're going to be exposed. But, uh, you know, you fake it until you make it, and eventually you do. And, and I don't think that's such a bad thing. I, I, I don't think that's how women feel, though. 
I think that women believe that they have to be perfect in order yes. to... Yes, oh, in, I in agree. Order ...before they... I, before oh. they... And that is what... And that is, you know, but the, the, I think there's a, a grain of truth in the imposter syndrome. There's a grain of truth there. Because yes. you know what? No, you're right. The workplace was create. You know, this is... It is not anyone's fault, and I have been supported by men and women both in my career, but the workplace... We spent a lot of time, hundreds of years making politics in a workplace a comfortable place for men. It was created by men. So when you feel like I don't quite fit in, or if I tear up at work, it's a disaster, um, or you know, I just look at this a different way and my answer is gonna be wrong, so I need to change it it's to be what everyone's expect to see and hear, I think that's because you're a woman trying to fit into a world that has still been dominated by by male by a male history okay. and what I'm telling women is you your perspective if you're the only woman in the room or there's only two women in the room your perspective matters more not less and that, you need your yeah. voice is needed and you need to speak up I don't think anybody looks at the world today and thinks we have all the answers we have it all figured out and nobody I, and thinks I, that I, there, there's really nothing I can so dis- more people speaking up is important Jennifer, there's nothing I can disagree with there I, I do agree with everything you're saying I, the only thing I want to say is that if you are a lady uh, elected to be the president of the United States, at this po- or the CEO of a company or anything, at that point, you don't any longer have to worry uh, about saying the wrong thing because everybody in the position of the president or the CEO is always going to have a naysayer or a jealous person or an sure. egotist or somebody who's going to try to cut you down. You can look at any president, whether it's Trump or Obama or anybody, there's always been the press and, and the media in general that has a, a nasty streak through them. So as, the, as a woman president, you're going to be faced with the same thing. You might believe that the press is nasty to you because you're a woman, but I don't know. I think that's just the way it is. But ultimately, the decisions you make have to be good for everybody. You, it, I, and I think in this country, we are... Please disagree with me if you're wrong and, and tell me so, but I think we do lead the, the, the world in this regard. I think there are a lot of countries that... We, we go to this restaurant every afternoon just about, and this little lady from India, she, she's so free here compared to what she had to put up with in India. Sure. What I'm not, I'm not worried about, what I'm worried about are the women that don't, you know, that aren't, um, that don't make it to be the head of the con- uh, country, the head of the company, right? I want those women to know the power of their voice. I want them to know yeah, that, um, I, you know, I want, you know, and, and I feel like the baby boomer generation, uh, Hillary's generation, they had, women in that generation had to prove that they could do uh, whatever job they were doing, they had to prove that they could do it the same way as a man. Right. Um, and, you know, no allowances need to be made for me, I will do it the same. And my point is, of course we could do it the same, but maybe we should do it a little differently. Maybe that's, maybe we have a very limited sense of leadership. And if we brought more, if women brought more of their full selves to work, and or however they engage in the world, if they felt less inhibited to share their views and felt more confident in them, that would probably make the world a better place. And by the way, maybe there's some things that men are holding back to. So I think what this moment has told me is that women feel empowered to engage in the world in a new way and in, um, you know, whether that's in politics, you see all these women running for office or in the Me Too movement or through the Women's March, that we know we haven't reached full equality yet. So as great as much progress that we've made and as good as the world is now, and certainly the United States is better than most countries, uh, there's still more we can achieve. And so that is what I find inspiring about this yeah, moment, absolutely. and I'm surprised to feel that way. So when, uh, so we've only got two years till the next election, so all these women that are, you know, that, that were standing up against Donald Trump and everything, saying there should be a woman in the White House, is there a woman out there right now that is being groomed by all these other women to run in 2020? I think there's a lot of women who might run in 2020. Yeah, but is there any right um, now that 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 we can you know look at or something that who's who's going to be out there in the forefront right now? Um, I think sure. I think there's a number of them. Um, Elizabeth Warren, um, Kirsten Gillibrand, Senator from New York, uh, mm-hmm. Kamala Harris, Senator from California. 
Amy Klobuchar, Senator from Minnesota. Claire McCaskill, Senator from Missouri. She's in a tough race for re-election. So is Amy. Well, Amy's not in a tough race, but Amy uh, Klobuchar is also up for re-election in Minnesota. Yeah, but are, um, are, is, is there a woman that's going to be running for president in 2020 that yeah, we I'm can saying, talk about I right think now? All of those women, all them are possible. I think all, all those women. Possible. I think all those women may run for president in 2020. Okay. Um, the and I think I think particularly Gillibrand, Warren, and Harris. Um, I'd say were the three most likely. And I think any one of them, it's you know, it's going to be a big field in 2020. I think any one of them, any one of those three, it's possible they could win. Well, I hope they get out there now so we know well, about we, we them. We spoke to a lady uh, running for governor of Georgia, and I think she'd be a viable candidate yeah. too. Yeah, Stacey Abrams, she's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for taking the time to do this with us. I, I think the world is becoming better. I, d- I do agree with you that the the road you've had to tow as as women has been uh, not fair. I'm I'm really happy that the the um, um, the Me Too movement has happened only because as a man it, it's, it's horribly embarrassing to know that my, uh, my fellow men and, they're, and I think they're in the minority I hope anyway have, mm-hmm. have not shown respect for our sisters um, and, and, but I don't think most of my friends have been that way I've probably had a few but anyway I haven't known anybody Jen- oh I know some <laughs> I can tell you I know some <laughs> Jennifer, thank you for what you're doing. I think you're making thank you so much. the world a better place. The, the book is called Dear Madam President. We have a copy of it. If you'd like it, call us right now. I found it on Amazon. Uh, Jennifer, real quickly, do you have a website you can uh, recommend? Yeah, it's called Dear Madam President Book, um, dot com. All right, easy enough. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Fox News Radio, I'm Chris Foster. On their way back to the United States right now, three Korean Americans who'd been held prisoner in North Korea. Fox's John Roberts reports. They are Kim Dong Chul, Kim Hak Song, and Kim Sung Duk, also goes by the name Tony Kim. The last two taught at the foreign funded Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. Kim Dong Chul was a businessman who was accused of spying by North Korea and sentenced to 10 years hard labor. He was detained in 2015. The others last year, they're all flying back with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. There's a confirmation hearing today for Gina Haspel, President Trump's nominee to replace Pompeo as CIA director. She says the agency's learned tough lessons from its harsh interrogation tactics on terror suspects after 9-11. Under my leadership, on my watch, CIA will not restart a detention and interrogation program. Fox News. We report. You decide. When you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes. You want an efficient way to get to a short list of qualified candidates. That's why you need Indeed.com. Post a job in minutes. Set up screener questions based on your job requirements. Then zero in on qualified candidates using an intuitive online dashboard. Discover why 3 million businesses use Indeed for hiring. Post a job today at Indeed.com slash hire. Search for greatness. Search. 